Thank you very much. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us today. My name is Ekaterina Aristova and it is a great pleasure for me to open an online symposium for on civil liability for business-related human rights abuses. The symposium is a collaborative initiative which is organized jointly by the International Commission of Jurists and the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights. And I would like to thank Dr. Carlos Lopez for his hard work in putting this event together. Thank you, Carlos and all colleagues on both sides. The purpose of the symposium is to discuss the trend towards reliance on civil liability claims to enhance corporate accountability for human rights violations. The English and Dutch courts have made headlines earlier this year by passing decisions in cases concerning environmental and more recently climate change impacts of Shell Group's operations. These decisions built upon previous successful attempts to enhance parent company liability, such as Langover versus Vedanta in the UK and Nefson case in Canada. Carlos and I invited a group of experts from academia and legal practice to discuss the wider implications of these developments and identify the remaining gaps in law. Today, our first panel discussion will focus on the problem of parent company liability and the scope of duty of care doctrine. We are very lucky to have with us today Richard Mirren, Chana Samkaldun, Martin Petrin, Igor Sikata, Sophie Kemp, Anil Ilmas Vastadis. I will introduce the speakers in due course in further detail. Next week, next Monday on 14 June at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, the second panel will talk about existing barriers to judicial remedies and how they have been evolving over the last few years. If you want to join us next week, you will have to register separately. Please don't forget to do this. The final component of the symposium is a series of blogs to be published by Pinya Juris platform starting from 21st of June. The blogs will complement panel discussions and will, among other issues, focus on the problems of supply chain liability, corporate complicity, and judicial imperialism. For the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights, this symposium is part of the project on civil liability for human rights violations funded by the Oak Foundation. The project is comparative study across 17 jurisdictions to determine whether and when the law of civil remedies provides a real opportunity to hold state and non-state actors accountable. We are grateful to the Oak Foundation and Nina Shpataro for supporting this important research. Few final remarks before we move to the presentations. This event is recorded and the recording will be available via the Bonavera Institute's YouTube channel. I would like to thank my colleague, Daniela garrida Alps for IT support today behind the screen. We will have a Q&A session with the audience. Please enter your question in a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It's enough speaking from me, and we're moving to our presentations. Our first speaker today is Richard Mirren. Richard is a partner and head of the international department at Lee Day, where he led a significant number of cases against UK multinationals. Richard, we're looking forward to hearing from you about key trends and recent developments in the UK. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Ekaterina, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to give a brief overview of the development of parent company litigation in England. In recent years, we've seen an increase in cases against multinational parent companies and progressive development of English law in this area. Key categories of claim have been for occupational injury and disease, environmental damage, human rights abuses by private and public security, and child labour exploitation, just to give some key examples. Apart from various cases brought, for example, under the Peruvian and Com Colombian civil codes, these cases have all been based on an alleged tort law duty of care owed by parent companies to workers and communities who have suffered harm at and around overseas subsidiary operations. The Rome II regulation and prior to 2009, a UK statute, have generally meant that the applicable law is that of the place where the harm occurred. However, English law has been of wider relevance because former British colonies have English law systems that essentially apply English law. Back in the early 90s, when I began the first series of UK parent company cases, those are Connolly and Rio Tinto, the case against Thor Chemicals, and on behalf of South African asbestos miners against Cape PLC, I recall vividly canvassing the opinion of a very eminent QC with the idea of arguing for a tort-based parent 
uh, parent company duty of care. He told me it was a great idea, but that it would never succeed. Uh, luckily, back then, I was sufficiently naive to ignore his advice. But things didn't start off too well when on the first day of the hearing in the Thor Chemicals case in 1994, the judge pointedly asked, why are all these South African workers suing in my court? Nevertheless, in 1995, a Thor strikeout application failed and the judge ruled that there was a clear evidential basis of which, upon which the plaintiffs could argue their case to establish the liability of the parent company. In that case, one of the allegations was that the parent had designed the hazardous technology that had caused mercury poisoning. In 1998, in a strikeout application in the Connolly and Rio Tinto case, the judge referred to the allegation that Rio Tinto had taken responsibility for devising an appropriate policy for health and safety at the local mine and had supervised the implementation of that policy. He concluded that if true, this would impose a duty of care on the parent company. The Cape PLC case for South African asbestos miners alleged that the parent company had effective control over health and safety at the South African mines. In 1998, recognizing the arguability of a parent company duty, the Court of Appeal uh, formulated a uh, a preliminary issue for determination. Uh, although the expression foreign direct liability arose from these three cases, uh, none of them actually led to a determination of the parent company duty issue. Uh, protracted forum non-convenience disputes occupied the bulk of the litigation in those days, which of course, until the 1st of January this year, was brought to an end by the 2005 European Court of Justice decision in Owusu and Jackson. It was not until Chandler v Cape in 2012 that in England we had the first trial verdict imposing liability on a parent company based on its negligent omission to advise on precautionary measures to protect the health of workers at its UK subsidiary. The duty of care to provide such advice stemmed particularly from the parent company's awareness of the risks to the workers, its superior knowledge of health and safety, and its awareness that the subsidiary was relying on the parent company to provide that superior knowledge. So that was the, uh, the uh, ratio of the Court of Appeal decision in Chandler. Nevertheless, in subsequent cases, multinationals argued that the application of the Chandler decision was limited to cases involving uh, work-related injuries and uh, employees of UK subsidiaries. The position was, however, clarified and developed by the 2000, in 2019 by the Supreme Court in the Vedanta judgment on behalf of Zambian communities who lived around the copper mine of the company's subsidiary. The court held that the core test is that everything depends on the extent to which and the way in which the parent avails itself of the opportunity to take over, intervene in, intervene in control, supervise or advise the management of the relevant operations of the subsidiary. All that the existence of a parent subsidiary relationship demonstrates is that the parent had such an opportunity. The judgment confirmed that there is no specific category of negligence that applies to multinational parent companies, but that the question of whether a duty of care should be imposed depends on the facts in, ac in accordance with general tort law principles. The court referred to four scenarios in which a duty of care might be imposed. First, where the parent has in substance taken over the management of the relevant activity of the subsidiary in place of or jointly with the subsidiary's own management. Secondly, where a parent has given defective advice or provided defective group-wide environmental stroke safety policies, which the subsidiaries have implemented as a matter of course. Thirdly, where the parent has taken active steps to ensure that group-wide policies are implemented by subsidiaries. And fourthly, and perhaps most strikingly, where the parent holds itself out publicly as exercising a degree of control of or supervision of its subsidiaries, even if it does not in fact do so. A further blow to multinational uh, impunity was delivered by the UK Supreme Court in the Barbie case in February this year, in which 40,000 claimants alleged that oil spills and pollution from pipelines operated in Nigeria by Shell subsidiary there caused substantial environmental damage to water. The claim was based in Australia on alleged duty of care on the part of 
Royal Dutch Shell, the parent company, arising from its significant control over its Niger Nigerian subsidiary and its assumption of responsibility of subsidiary operations throughout the group wide throughout uh, the, the the group's group wide mandatory uh, through the group wide the group wide mandatory policies. I'm sorry. The Supreme Court was critical of the lower court, critical of the lower court, saying that it applied too much focus to the issue of control of the subsidiary rather than management of aspects of its activities. It was wrong to decide that the group wide policies could not give rise to a duty of care should not have treated the issue of parent company liability as a special category, had imposed too high a bar at the stage of a jurisdictional challenge in circumstances in which the claimants had not had the benefit of discovery stroke disclosure of documents. Then on a roll in Mar March of this year in Begum and Moran, the Court of Appeal ruled that a UK company that had sold a ship to a third party, which had uh, which had um, uh, caused fatal injuries uh, to workers uh, who involved in breaking up the ship. Um, and um, uh, in doing so, it applied an established exception to the principle that, the def that a defendant is not generally liable for the acts of a third party in circumstances where, uh, uh, sorry, in doing so, it applied an established exception to the principle that a defendant is not liable for the acts of a third party in circumstances where the defendant has created the danger. So that was, uh, um, that's where we've got to. So the principle of parent company liability is now well established. And I don't think any English judge would ask nowadays why all these South Africans are suing in their court. However, the UK's departure from the European Union and the Brussels regulation and the indication that EU member states will refuse to allow the UK to join the Lugano Convention, whilst un understandable, is a retrograde development in this area and will take us back to the days of protracted forum nonconvenience disputes. In that case, claimants' ability to maintain proceedings in England will depend on their ability to prove that they cannot obtain access to justice in their local courts. In that regard, the principle established in the Connolly and, and Rio Tinto case and applied in Lubba versus Cape and in the Vedanta case, namely that a forum non-convenience application will be dismissed if lack of funding for lawyers and scientific experts would result in a denial of substantial justice is of particular importance. Now, I'd just like to conclude by emphasizing the importance of, of viewing these, these cases in a wider business and human rights context. Multinational human rights litigation and the field of business and human rights have developed concurrently since the mid 1990s and have been mutually reinforcing. Initially, there was resistance to the notion that corporations could have human rights obligations and whether cases based on allegations of negligence should, notwithstanding their subject matter, properly be characterized as human rights cases. However, over time, these cases became an integral focus of the business and human rights debate. And of course, the human rights due diligence duty, which is a central element of the corporate duty to respect human rights of the UNGPs essentially corresponds to a tort law duty of care. The placing of multinational human rights cases at the heart of the business and human rights field has provided a focus for pressure to be applied by civil society on business and on investors in business. Being implicated in human rights abuses can have serious reputational and financial ramifications, especially for a business whose supply chain involves consumers. Graphic example of this is the suspension by UK supermarkets of purchases of avocados from plantations operated in Kenya by a subsidiary of UK parent company Camellia PLC following allegations of serious human rights abuses by security guards against local communities. Businesses should anticipate that human rights standards that are adopted, even of, on a voluntary basis, may give rise to legal liability. Moreover, as per the Vedanta judgment, the omission on the part of a parent company to exercise a level of supervision and control over su subsidiary operations to which it has publicly committed may give rise to liability. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Richard. I know we gave you quite ambitious assignment to fit years of your experience in 10 minutes, but you've done so smoothly. Thank you for that. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Chanison Calden, uh, who is a lawyer at Packen de Oliveira in the Netherlands, where she specializes in the liability of human rights violations. Chana represents four Nigerian farmers and friends of the earth in proceedings against Shell concerning oil pollution in Nigeria. Chana, we're interested in hearing your thoughts about recent developments and key trends in the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as I prepared some slides, I will try to see if I can share those. <laughs> um, um, let me quickly get that. Uh, yes. Good. Fail to start. Oh, that's a pity. Um, Would you like me to start? Yeah, I can't seem to share. Yeah, please do. Although I sent you a, a little bit of an older version, um, but the only thing um, you know uh, that hasn't been fully um, corrected. But if you um, if you can, then that would be helpful because somehow I can't seem to. Be, uh, I'm not able to share my screen. Can you see it now? Um, I can see it. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. So um, let's move on to the first slide and immediately I'll have to tell you then when, when to, uh, to press that, but thank you. And apologies beforehand for some minor spelling mistakes that are still in this version, <laughs> um, <laughs> as it was a free and very one. Um, so what I would like to do is to um, um, explain to you some recent developments actually by um, going into two judgments that have been made this year that I think are particularly interesting as regards current company liability and probably the most important decisions that have been uh, judgments that have been given in the Netherlands. Um, and this occurred within a time frame of a couple of months. And interestingly enough, the same parties were involved in those judgments. The first is the one that um, you spoke briefly about before. Um, it's the case of Milieu Defensie, Friends of the Earth in the Netherlands against Shell Nigeria and Royal Dutch Shell for oil pollution in um, Nigeria. Um, there was a judgment by the Court of Appeal um, in January, wherein the Nigerian subsidiary was held liable for the oil spills, and both the, the Nigerian subsidiary and um, Royal Dutch Shell were ordered to make sure that a leak detection system is installed. So the parent company responsibility was assumed in that case. And then very recently, we saw the judgment in the other case, also by Friends of the Earth, together with a couple of other um, NGOs and Dutch citizens against Royal Dutch Shell, uh, only the parent company, about um, their role and um, responsibility um, for climate change. This was a judgment of May 26th. And I've, I've put here a link, I'm not sure if it's um, um, anything you could click on, but that's to the English translation of that judgment. And here in this judgment, uh, Royal Dutch Shell was ordered to reduce the aggregate annual volume of its emissions, and not only its own business emissions, but also that um, of um, its end product as used by consumers by at least 45% uh, by 2030. So what I want to do is walk you briefly through these two cases um, to explain um, what's been going on. Um, so let's go to the next slide, because I think it's important to first point out some, some procedural issues that are always relevant in these cases and also explain the different approaches that the courts have taken in these two cases. Um, and complications we see always when we are um, dealing with um, foreign liability cases and parent company liability cases, um, it usually starts with jurisdiction um, and the contest of the jurisdiction. Um, and there has been uh, battles about that, uh, not so much in the climate uh, case, as I will point out later, um, but very much so in the Shell Nigeria case, wherein um, Shell argued that it, this was primarily a Nigerian issue. Um, and the next question that caused a lot of procedural um, complications is that of applicable law. Once jurisdiction is established, um, Dutch procedural law will apply as the lex fori, the lex of forum, and this entails all rules as regards civil procedure, 
um, to some extent the admissibility, but to some extent then that is the, the, the law that is applicable, and it will determine the rules on disclosure or access to evidence. Um, but very often in foreign liability cases, the applicable law will not be Dutch law. It may very well be, particularly in climate cases or in uh, environmental cases, um, but if the damage occurs elsewhere, um, the law that applies is often the law from that place where the damage occurs. And that means that questions of liability, the right of action, the burden of proof and time limitations are all determined by the actual applicable law. And the combination of these different legal systems and very often, for example, in our Nigeria case, um, applicable law is common law um, and uh, the, the law of the forum is a civil law system. There is an interaction that can create additional problems as we've seen in um, parent company liability cases. So let's point it out firstly um, with reference to the Shell Nigeria case, which is the next slide. I presented a brief overview. This is a case that started in 2008. Actually, the preparation started a couple of years before that. The case was filed in 2008 as the very first parent company liability case, at least within the Netherlands, but I believe um, um, also on an international scale. Um, and it took years to uh, get a judgment, a district court judgment, at, finally was delivered in 2013 after five years and it took another uh, six years before the Court of Appeal made its judgment in 2021. So that means 13 years of litigation before we finally got some uh, justice in that case. It was a case brought on behalf of um, uh, Friends of the Earth the Netherlands which represented the local victims from three different oil spills and there were four, four individual Nigerian farmers as, um, as claimants as well. And the defendants were, as said, the Dutch parent company and the Nigerian subsidiary of Shell. Um, the claim was for a declaration of law on liability, particularly that was important for the representative action because as a representative organization, Friends of the Earth could only ask for a declaration of law. They could not claim damages directly and uh, compensation for the individual farmers, as well as an injunction um, to take precautionary measures and remediation. And as we will see, that injunction was granted as regards the installment of a leak detection system. Um, I'm gonna walk you through some of these procedural complications that we faced in this case. Um, if we can move on to the next uh, slide, as I already indicated, the first one was the jurisdiction which was thoroughly fought by Shell. Um, they said there was no jurisdiction because this was purely a Nigerian issue. And they said that the claim against the parent company, which was the, the foundation for, jurisdi for jurisdiction, as if the jurisdiction was based on an article similar to the current article eight of the process regulation that didn't apply, but we have a similar one in Dutch uh, uh, procedural law saying that if you have multiple defendants and the cases are closely connected, a court may assume jurisdiction as regards a foreign party as well. And Shell said, well, you're only suing the parent company here to gain jurisdiction, but there's obviously no claim whatsoever against the parent company. So um, that should be um, dismissed. And in fact, you made an abuse of procedural law when bringing this claim. Uh, luckily, this argument was quite, um, um, well, not quickly, I should say, but convincingly <laughs> dismissed by both the district courts and the court of appeal. Um, and um, so the next question that came up was that of applicable law. Nowadays, um, if Rome applies, you might have a choice, or at least you might try to make an argument saying if it's environmental damage, that the relevant decisions were taken in the Netherlands, perhaps one could say, or it has been suggested, that you could then argue that Dutch law should apply, but this was from before Rome. Um, uh, so we could not make that argument regardless of whether it would have held. Um, so it was Nigerian law that applied and that means it was a reference to common law because Nigerian law refers back to general common law as regards parent company um, liability. And this was good for Shell to argue that um, uh, the Dutch court should be very conservative in its application of the law um, when applying a foreign legal system. Um, as said, the standing was a combination of these two things. 
um, Shell argued that Defense of the Earth could not um, uh, have any standing, and also that even if it would have standing, it uh, could not um, suspend the time limitations applicable to individual victims that it said it represents for the individual victims once they would want to take the positive judgment to court and claim the damages, their claim would be time barred. Um, let's go on to the next slide and I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going very much into this because I think it takes quite a bit of time. I'd like to go into the other cases as well. Um, but this is just to, to highlight each of these issues, I think, were part of the reason that the litigation took a very long time. And they're also very, very um, a good illustration of the complications of the different legal systems. Dutch legal procedure really doesn't know a discovery phase as many common law systems have. You really have to argue for specific documents if you want them, um, if you want the court to rule that you're entitled to get those documents. We didn't manage to do that in, in, in first instance. Luckily, in appeal, that was the case. Um, but that makes it very difficult to apply common law, which is based on a totally different premises, basically, um, when it's being developed. Um, let's move on to the duty of care. As I, as I um, already explained, the Dutch court did find that there was a duty of care of the Shell parent company here. It did so when applying uh, common law, well, Richard has, has said sufficiently about that. It, it, it's interesting, I think, unfortunately, the translations are not there yet, um, but you see that it's a, a court applying common law that's not really used to applying those rules. It's, it really looks at the judgments and tries to read them as statutes basically and um, the distinguished principles that it can apply you know strictly on on a new situation uh, it did apply the Vedanta judgment but then it also included principles from the Templar case principles from Caparo whereas you know the Supreme Court said in Vedanta that doesn't really apply here um, nonetheless the result was good enough for my clients the court ruled that since the parent company had knowledge and control in the installment of elite protection systems, it had the awareness that it wasn't there, so it had the responsibility to make sure that a leak detection system is installed to prevent further damage. Um, that's all I wanted to say about this case for now. I wanted to briefly point out a few aspects and, and differences that we've seen in the climate uh, case of last week or two weeks ago only. Um, that will be on the next slide. That was a case initiated in 2019, so it took considerably um, less time to get a first judgment from the district court. Um, it was again Friends of the Earth, as I said, um, against only Royal Dutch Shell. Here too, the claimants asked for a declaration of law as well as injunction to reduce emissions. That was, as you know, eventually um, granted. Um, the jurisdiction um, wasn't really an issue here. This is on the next uh, slide. Um, as RDS is um, established in the Netherlands and there was no argument to be made there. Um, the standing was an issue and in the end the court limited the standing of the NGOs to the extent that they represented the interests of the Dutch um, population and inhabitants of um, the Wadersee the, and the Netherlands. Um, they thought that, you know, whereas the NGOs said that they represented the entire world's population, that was really too far uh, stretched. Um, the applicable law here was Dutch law because uh, Friends of the Earth successfully argued that the relevant decisions were taken from the Netherlands as regards climate change. And so the legal framework as regards the duty of care is fairly different from the one that we see in the Shell Nigeria cases because now the courts apply Dutch law. And the Dutch legal system, I think, is um, um, can be, uh, as a typical feature, has many open norms, and the courts have many ways to deal with these open norms. Um, and this is also in the next slide. Um, what the court applied is an article, which is basically our general tort article, um, saying that it's unlawful to act in conflict with what is generally accepted behavior according to unwritten law. I mean, this is basically, I mean, you could regard it as a common law article, but it's really been established in, 
in, the, in case law what is acceptable behavior. And interestingly, the court has taken many circumstances into account when coming to its conclusions. It's, um, it's, it's the danger at stake, the, the likelihood and the seriousness of harm. Um, it takes regard to the fundamental rights but very interestingly, it also explicitly mentions and, and deals with the UN guiding principles and directly applies the UN guiding principles to the situation. And that's one of the, the, the larger reasons, if you look at the argumentation of the judgment, that the court thinks that it's appropriate to also include the scope three emissions in its judgment because of the obligation that is made explicit in the UN guiding principles that one needs to avoid causing harm, contributing to harm, or even being linked to any kind of negative environmental impacts. Um, it also takes reference to the position of Shell and the influence of the parent company and the proportionality, and the effectiveness of any obligation that is at stake. So there's a number of factors that the court looks into to reach the conclusion that in this case, um, it is appropriate to, to conclude that there is a duty of care and it's been very relevant that there has been no argument and no conflict between parties as to the question um, if there is a need to reduce emissions. Parties agreed on, on, on the necessity of that. They just disagreed on who needs to take what measures at this point in time. So um, there was no declaratory position here, but that doesn't make any real legal changes because of course the the declaration of unlawfulness is kind of included in the injunction that is that is granted. Um, so, Shana, yes. I, will, I will ask uh, you to start wrapping up. Yes, I was actually coming to my conclusion and, I, and maybe I don't even need to really get into that. Um, and, and that's also the final slide. Um, I think there have been some really very interesting developments in the Netherlands and we can expect some more in the, in the light of these two judgments that have been given and we're eagerly awaiting those new cases. Excellent, thank you very much. It's really great to hear firsthand about this landmark decisions and also um, fabulous that um, the, in the last, in the climate change case, the court referred to UN guiding principles, which I believe one of the first um, occasions um, uh, in the jurisprudence. Um, thank you. We are now moving to the presentation uh, by Professor Martin Petrin, who is a Dunker Private Equity Chair in Corporate Governance at Western University. He is on special leave from University College London now. Martin has published widely and served as a consultant in areas of corporate governance, business law and corporate regulation. And we have asked Martin to um, answer the following question, um, whether the emerging trend of pushing the boundaries of tort law in parent company liability has pros but also cons, and is it an appropriate solution for resolving the problem of corporate accountability? Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for, for putting together this interesting event. And thank you for having me. Um, I trust everybody sees my slide? Yes. All good? Okay, great. So um, as Ekaterina said, um, I've been asked to share some thoughts on whether it makes sense to expand the boundaries of tort law when it comes to these group liability or parent company liability cases. So I'll talk about two questions. Is this broader type of liability justified? Um, and I will argue that it is. And then in, as the second question, um, I'll share some thoughts on how to implement that sort of broader liability framework. And we've heard some really interesting um, points on developments when it comes to cases and, and practice. Um, I will now sort of take a step back and talk a bit more about some basics or theoretical aspects. Um, so the starting point for me as someone who's active in the area of corporate law and tort law, sort of the, the intersection of these two is, you know, what's the purpose of business? What's the purpose of the corporation? And broadly speaking, there are two ways of looking at this. So one school of thought is the stakeholderist or stakeholder view. So if you're a stakeholderist, you will argue that the purpose of corporations is not only about making as much money as possible for shareholders, but it's also about taking into account and advancing interests of other stakeholders. So that can be customers, or regulators, environment, suppliers, employees, uh, society at large, 
also shareholders, of course, they're still important, but they're one stakeholder among others. So uh, if you look at the question of parent company liability uh, from the viewpoint of these stakeholders, then it will be very difficult to say that it's okay to have tort victims that are uncompensated because they were harmed not by a parent company in a business, but by a, a group member, you know, like a subsidiary. So from the stakeholders point of view, um, it's quite clear. Yes, it's justified. Yes, it makes sense to expand parent company liability. Now, um, there's another view on, on corporate theory and what's the purpose of corporations. And I would argue that's still the dominant view today. And that's the contractarian or the law and economics view. And contractarians or law and economics scholars say the point of having corporations, the purpose of corporations is for them to maximize shareholder wealth. And um, given that that's the, the, the point of view of these scholars, you would think that they are, of course, against expanding parent company liability. But surprisingly, that's not actually the case. So why is that? The starting point is limited liability, just the basic principle of limited liability. Um, so law and economic scholars say limited liability is extremely beneficial because it helps um, facilitate the aggregation of capital. You know, you're an individual shareholder. You will happily contribute money, capital to businesses because you know you don't face personal liability. That also reduces shareholders uh, time and money spent on monitoring businesses or managers because they know uh, the money that's at risk is, is limited. And then it also enhances capital market liquidity because buyers and sellers know, you know, we're not exposed to personal liability. So overall, limited liability is seen as high welfare maximizing. Now, the interesting thing is that when it comes to groups, and corporate shareholders, so parents and subsidiaries, these same law and economic scholars think that limited liability should not apply here or it doesn't fully apply. So why is that? Um, one point or one reason is that even if you let a claimant or plaintiff circumvent limited liability, so the plaintiff was harmed by a subsidiary and goes after the parent company, there's still limited liability for the individual shareholders that are shareholders of the parent. So you see that on the graph here. So as long as the ultimate shareholders, the shareholders of the parent have limited liability, the law and economic scholar is still happy. Um, the other reason is that the reasons that I mentioned earlier, you know, why do we have limited liability? Monitoring is cheaper, uh, capital aggregation is facilitated, it encourages diversified investments, that doesn't really apply in the parent or the group context. It applies to individual shareholders, but not so much to, to parents and subsidiaries. And finally, when it comes to groups, there's also this issue of moral hazard problems and they are exacerbated. So as we know, um, parent companies or groups are tempted to conduct risky activities through subsidiaries because they can then be insulated from liability. So for all these reasons, uh, law and economic scholars say limited liability is great, but shouldn't apply to corporate shareholders. It shouldn't apply to parents or groups. So that's one of those rare convergences. I don't think we see it anywhere else where stakeholderists and law and economic scholars agree on something. You know, there should be broader liability. So on the point of does it make sense to have broader tort liability for, for parents, for groups? Um, yes, in my opinion, that's the case. So then just briefly. How do we implement that? What kind of regime should we have? And of course, you know, if you heard the, the cases now, the trend is to say plaintiffs, claimants, third parties that were harmed by subsidiaries, they are given the right to bring claims against parent companies um, based on the theory that the parent owed a duty of care to that plaintiff or claimant. Now I have to admit, I'm not a huge fan of that approach. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, so one being that it's not really clear what kind of control is needed um, on, on, on part of the parent over the, the subsidiaries to say, yes, there's enough to, to impose liability. And, and that creates uncertainty. 
also, I think we would like to have parents that are in control of subsidiaries. There should be group five policies on health and safety and so forth. But the current system um, discourages that because you know the parent will say, I'm not gonna have any group five policies because that can then you know lead to me being liable. So I don't think it's a good idea. Um, and the other reason is I'm not even sure if it's the right question to ask. You know, is control on part of the parent necessary um, to impose liability? Why shouldn't there be liability if the, the parents did not exercise control? Why should it depend on the parents' diligence? I, I think if you operate as a group, as a business, then whatever you know, tort you um, cause as, as that group, um, that's on you. That's part of, you know, of doing business. That's the cost of doing business. And that should be internalized. Whether or not the parent was careful, I don't think that really matters. Um, there's another approach that's being discussed today, and that's the presumed liability approach. So briefly, the idea here is that um, the parent company will be liable unless it can show that it took certain preventive measures to, to make sure that you know, third parties are not harmed, um, due diligence. That's the approach that was suggested by the UN Business and Human Rights Treaty Working Group. And there are now a couple of jurisdictions that are working on imposing or implementing legislation to that effect. I, I think that's an improvement over the, the, the parent company cases, you know, these ones here where the parent has a direct duty to the plaintiff, but it's pretty much the same. The difference being that we just reverse the burden of proof, but other than that, not much has changed. And the question for me is still, why do we even need to show that the parent wasn't careful? Why is that necessary? So to, to wrap this up, my proposal is to have a, a two-tiered system. Tier one is we have full enterprise liability for traditional corporate groups. Traditional meaning it's a group that's connected via equity ownership. So if one of the group members, if a subsidiary causes harm to a third party, and it then cannot compensate the third party, the third party, in my view, should be able to go after the entire group. So this is what this would look like. Subsidiary C harms the plaintiff or claimant. Claimant can go after the entire group. And then we have to think about um, these atypical scenarios where we don't have a traditional group, but we have network companies. So there's no equity ownership, but there's a close relationship, let's say, because there's a supplier that has a contract to their business. Um, and if these sort of network companies are integrated uh, or enough integrated into a group and they cause harm to a third party, again, I think the third party should be able to go after the group. Uh, and this would look a bit like this. The supplier in this um, example causes harm to the plaintiff or claimant. Claimant should be able to go after the group. So these are my thoughts on, on the torts and, and parent company liability and happy to discuss further during the Q&A. Thank you very much, Martin, for presenting this alternative view. And also thank you for reminding us about the barriers such as the need to establish control and the limited liability principle and the burden of proof. All of this is certainly very relevant. Um, our next discussant is uh, Dr. Egesa Ekata who is a senior lecturer in law at the University of Derby, where he focuses on international environmental law and natural resources governance. Egosa has also been called to the Nigerian bar as a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court in um, Nigeria. Egosa, can you please provide a local view on shell litigation in the UK and the Netherlands and tell us about any significant developments in Nigeria towards strengthening access to justice in the local courts for victims? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you, can you see me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Thank you, uh, thank you for your uh, invitation to this workshop. So in, I'm just going to run through what I've got to everyone. In terms of the impact of the shell and other cases, I think I've spoken to a couple of NGOs and a couple of people in Nigeria. From a perspective of the Nigerian situation, they're, they're saying that it has basically created an alternative, another strategy which uh, communities, which um, local communities and 
NGOs can actually use as a way to improve access to justice. But the situation is, in terms of what happens in the UK and Shell and Netherlands, when there's a decision in the UK courts, automatically, for example, the last, um, the last decision in the German Supreme Court, there, there, there's a tendency for the uh, European uh, government to do like a legislative change. So they probably enact a law, they probably respect the a decision. But the problem is that in Nigeria, there's no corresponding action from the government. So if there's a judgment from the Netherlands, so what is the expectation of the Nigerian government? So that was a big question. So there appears to be a gap there because do we expect the Nigerian government to basically, in court, try to enforce the law? So what does led to enforce the judgment? So it has led to a situation where NGOs themselves, where community, community members themselves are using that as a way, as a, as a campaigning tool to say that if there's no access to justice in Nigeria, for example, we can look at other foreign jurisdictions. We can look at the the own countries of these multinational corporations in a way to hold them accountable for the activities. So there are some of the issues which, which I found that in the situation as well. In terms of the question which you uh, told me to answer, are there any recent developments in Nigeria in terms of local standard? Local standard is a very, very big problem in Nigeria in terms of uh, having the standing to actually sue. But in 2019, there was a recent, there's a recent judgment of the Nigerian Supreme Court uh, oil pollution case. In that case, the Nigerian Supreme Court actually expanded, liberalized local standard um, requirements in Nigeria. So it was a case that involved environmental NGOs. So initially, you have to be connected to the uh, to the pollution. It must have been a direct uh, it must have been a direct victim before you can actually sue. But now they've liberalized it. Environmental NGOs can actually sue on behalf of local communities in terms of access to justice. And I'm not sure that case is actually well known in the UK. It's a recent case. I can put the citation later. It's called Oil Pollution uh, Case 2019. Also in Nigeria as well, the other thing they're actually doing now is like the, the, the ECOWAS Court of Justice, for example, is one extra sort of um, a court, international judiciary that uh, NGOs, local communities are actually using as a way to access justice. We tend to also sue the Nigerian government in the ECOWAS Court of Justice. There's a popular SERAP case, not the SERAC one, the SERAP case, which is done by the ECOWAS Court of Justice in terms of holding the Nigerian government culpable and liable for environmental degradation arising from Ogoni land. So there's also a recent case, I think it was 2019, it's called Osaga, Osaga case. It was a group of uh, people from Niger Delta, about six or five litigants, to the Nigerian government to court in that case. So also not just people relying on UK, uh, Netherlands, Germany, there's also some opportunities within Africa, uh, especially within the use of sub-regional and regional courts in, in accessing environmental justice. So going back to in terms of the impact from, from the Nigerian perspective. So, uh, basically, the, the recent decisions against Shell has basically emboldened the citizens to stand up for justice. So now, it has given the incentive, it has given the sort of the go ahead for to to local communities to basically go and to approach NGOs in Nigeria, such as ERA. There's a popular NGO in Nigeria, ERA, which is like the local affiliates of um, of, um, of Friends of the Earth. And if you look at the various cases in the Ackman case and the rest of them, uh, Friends of the Earth always use ERA in Nigeria to gather information. So the one of the standouts from, from this litigation has been the rise of collaboration between international NGOs and local NGOs. You also do, you use local NGOs to get your information, to get the data. With that data, you'd be able to take the matter to the uh, foreign jurisdiction. So a very, very key sort of um, uh, output is in terms of collaboration between international and local NGOs. So now some of, so some of these communities are now seeking support directly from home countries. So to that extent, we can say these decisions have been effective in that regard. So however, from the government, the governmental perspective, things have not really changed. So that's a very big gap. So the government does not consider these cases as a major issue. I'm not, to my knowledge, I'm not sure the Nigerian government has expressly 
mentioned or talked about these judgments. For example, I'm not sure the Minister of State for Petroleum have actually spoken around this judgment and implication for the Nigerian oil and gas sector, something which is basically run by the NGOs, pushed by the NGOs. So there appears to be a disconnect between what the government wants or what the government is wanting in this regard. So I think that's a, that's a massive gap as well. But things are changing little by little. Uh, so as I said earlier, in comparison to Germany and the UK and other countries, in terms of the, in terms of the enforcement of the judgment, there's no corresponding governmental action to enforce those judgment in Nigeria. So that could be one way to look at it. So how do we make things better? The, the governments, the NGOs, the local communities have got a massive role to play. Do we need to develop a new enforcement mechanism? Or is it just a case of that the government should be seen, the Nigerian government should be seen to respect its obligations? It should have the political will to, to respect its obligations, to respect the rules and laws. So it could, it could, it could be as easy as that having a political will to do that. So then also the operators themselves, what are they doing? Why do I need to see you in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Canada? Why do I need to take you? Why do I need to travel and sue you? Why can't you be acting as good corporate citizens? Why do you have to be compelled to act in a proper way? So why, why is there a difference in the way a multinational corporation acts in the USA? For example, when you had the, the massive spill a few years ago, the Gulf of Mexico spill, then you have a lot of oil spills in Ogoni land for decades. So why is the disparity? Is it not the same company? So why? So there needs to be a change in corporate culture as well. So the business ethics guiding these companies, they need to respect those business ethics as well. And also, from the Niger Delta community's perspective, the, the citizens have to be vigilant. They should not be destroying this oil pipeline. So there, there's this argument by MNCs that there's a sabotage by uh, the citizens and communities. So the communities themselves, as a way, should protect this property, should protect this pipeline, and should not destroy this, this pipeline. Because if you are destroying this pipeline, in the rare instances where it's been destroyed or sabotaged, who's going to suffer it? The local community, the environment. So we need, as a community, as, as an Indian Delta community, we need to protect those resources. Because if they get destroyed, the local environment is going to be the first corporates in terms of the environmental disaster. So basically, we need to bring all these um, stakeholders. We need to come together, the government, the, the NGOs, the multinational corporations and local communities for us to have a proper enforcement. Because having this judgment, things have not changed. And the compensation is just for a tiny amount of community members. Do they have the funds to actually sue these multinational corporations? Taking, the, taking cases to, to the UK, to the US is expensive. It's, and there's no guarantee you're going to get judgment. And even though it's, it's compared to what happens in even Nigeria in terms of the, the judgments, the judiciary, the judicial system might be slow, but it's not actually fast. If you look at the evolution of these cases in the Netherlands, the Ackman case and the rest of them, it was not an overnight decision. It took time. And the damage is still continuing. So can every single community be able to sue multinational corporations. It's expensive, who bears the cost? So these are some of my thoughts around this. I hope I've been able to answer the question. Thank you very much. I think it's um, very insightful. And um, thank you for stressing this um, lack of political will and governmental action, which fits um, broadly in the wide uh, business and human rights uh, context that Richard was mentioning in, uh, in his um, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. Um, our next speaker is Sophie Kemp. Sophie is a partner at Kingsley Napoli, where she leads the firm's business and human rights group. Sophie represented the Corporate Responsibility Coalition and the International Commission of Juris as interveners in the Supreme Court in Akpabi versus Shell. Um, Sophie is also co-author of the report on how a regulator could monitor and enforce the proposed UK human rights diligence legislation. So she is well aware of all of the recent um, developments. And we asked Sophie to um, talk a little bit about the key implications of the Court's findings in shell cases for cases where damages are caused by the acts of third parties, such as police or armed criminals, not necessarily by the subsidiary itself, and the relevance of the duty of care jurisprudence for cases of corporate complicity. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thanks very much, Katya. Um, it, it, it's a, it, it, 
it's a big bill for me to achieve, achieve your task, uh, given how keen I am on regulation, but I, I, I've jumped at the challenge, so thank you. Um, I think what I'm really going to focus on today is looking at the liability for, uh, of corporates for the unlawful acts of third parties. It was really interesting to hear Richard um, at the beginning because it's so obvious that great strides have been made in respect of um, responsibility and liability of, of corporates for their subsidiaries. But when it comes to liability for the acts of third parties, either the police or criminal gangs, then we really are back at the beginning again, it seems to me. Um, so, Vedanta and Oppabi obviously cases much more about jurisdiction and liability um, for third parties, for liability for subsidiaries. Um, whereas when you're looking at liability for the unlawful acts of third parties, I think the really interesting case to look at is a case called Kadia Kalma uh, uh, and the Af African mining. And I'm going to focus on that, if I may. Um, so this was a case um, which was decided by the Court of Appeal back in February 2020. And to me, it's a really good illustration of the difficulty of holding corporate entities to um, account for the unlawful acts of third parties, in that, that case, the police. And the starting point really is that establishing joint responsibility in the law of tort is much more restricted than in other areas of the law, including criminal law, or even principles of equity that we, we know from the law of trusts. Um, so going then to look at the Kadia Kalma decision, there the um, appellants were um, inhabitants of quite a remote area of Sierra Leone um, called Tonkili. Um, and the respondents were a, a company called African Minerals and its subsidiaries. And they were the owner of and operators of two of the largest iron ore mines in that region. Interestingly, the relationship between those two companies was not in issue. There was no question of jurisdiction being in issue. Um, and indeed, many of the facts were not in issue. Um, so it, it's quite useful to look at from that point of view as being different to the Okpabi and Vedanta cases where much of the arguments was about jurisdiction and, um, as we've mentioned, subsidiary um, liability. Um, so the key events were um, unrest in November 2010 and April 2012, um, and there was significant local disturbances which resulted in really significant unlawful activity by some members of the Sierra Leone police. Um, so the trial judge had described it as violent chaos during the course of which many villagers were variously beaten, shot, gassed, robbed, sexually assaulted, squalidly incarcerated, and in one case killed. So really appalling abuses by the local police. Um, and the appellants brought proceeding against the um, respondents, um, African Minerals, alleging that they were liable for those wrongful acts of the Sierra Leone police. There are a number of different grounds and I'm not going to go into them all now, but the two of interest are whether um, African Minerals was liable for accessory liability acting in furtherance of a common tortious design with the Sierra Leone police, or whether African Minerals were liable for tortious acts of the tortious acts of the Sierra Leone police as a result of some direction or procuring or direct request of encouragement. So it, th what's really interesting that is that a lot of the facts weren't in dispute. The abuses were not in dispute. Interestingly, a lot of the conduct and the key interplay between African minerals and the police was not in dispute. For example, the judge found that payments had been made by African Minerals to the Sierra Leone police. During the incident, the, um, the mining company had provided vehicles to police. In fact, a key member of staff had driven the police around to various um, places where violence had taken place. The police were accommodated in the respondent's guest house. Senior management was aware 
of at least some risk that the police might go too far and use excessive force on the protesters. So you can see that there's actually real crucial involvement by the company with the police, which you often can opt evidence um, as you can here in other cases. But the judge had found, a, a trial had found that the support had been justified, stating that the local police were so seriously under-resourced in personnel and equipment and finance that in his view, the police, the African minerals had little choice other than to run the risk that unlawful protests would otherwise continue unchecked and could well deteriorate into action, imperiling both the safety of the mine and those who worked there. So it was interesting, um, and it is an interesting judgment to look at, to, to see that really they took into account, uh, the, the court took into account the social and political context of policing and didn't think that that level of support was unusual in the circumstances, although it would have been had it been in perhaps um, the UK, well, in fact, where it had been extremely unusual. Um, the appellants obviously felt rather differently about the view that the support provided uh, and argued that the judge should have inferred an intention on the part of African minerals, um, that they intended that the protests be quashed if needed by the use of excessive violence. And it's said that there were a number of factual um, matters at the first instance trial, which simply just didn't go in the appellant's favor. Uh, so evidential issues for them there. But the real killer to the case was the really actually high threshold for establish, establishing common design, which is necessary um, to establish uh, tort in this area. So the Court of Appeal completely disagreed with the appellants and said that um, in reliance on cases of Monsanto and Tilly and also a, an important case called Credit Leonese and ECGD, that the key principle is that only a person or a corporation who acts with another to commit a tort in furtherance of a common design will be liable as a joint tort visa. It is not enough that he merely facilitates the commission of the tort unless his assistance is given in pursuance and furtherance of the common design. So it's there, it's simply not enough that you provide support. You've really got to show an evidence that there was some intention to commit wrongdoing on the part of the corporation and not just the police. So that then was fatal to the appellant's claim because the trial judge had no, found no instigation, direction, counselling or procuring. And in other words, no intention. Interestingly, the appellants also argued that intent could be inferred by African mineral support of the Sierra Leone police. However, given the judge's findings that there was no intent, that argument simply fell away. Um, it did, though, lead to, I think, a rather unfortunate comment from the Court of Appeal and Lord Justice Coulston, and, in which he said, he basically made a reference um, to the type of situation that he thought had arisen in the case. And, and he, his example was that a party who calls on the services of the police to restore law and order cannot be liable in tort for the actions of the police simply because it is foreseeable that the police might use excessive force to achieve that result. And so I think you can see that that reasoning is going to be quite a difficult hurdle for claimants to overcome. Um, and the common purpose bar is actually a very high hurdle and evidentially difficult to meet. So that's why I say uh, we're really back at the beginning in terms of establishing corporate liability for the unlawful acts of third parties. Um, so I think, to my mind, there were quite a few unsatisfactory aspects of the judgment, and it was really interesting to hear um, Egosha talking about corporate citizenship, because I think that really comes into play here. It, this judgment will allow the, the less well-intentioned corporates to rely on the police and, in effect, turn a blind eye to any wrongdoing in an unregulated um, and perhaps um, 
less standards-based police force in, in jurisdictions worldwide. Uh, and that, to me, seems to contain those activities where in, it should be an opportunity uh, for corporates to use their leverage to encourage proper conduct and standards of behaviour on the part of the police. And I think it's going to be quite interesting to use um, mandatory human rights due diligence laws and guidelines to um, encourage corporates to look at um, standards and standards of interaction with lo lo local police forces, particularly where payments have to be made to achieve some kind of um, policing, as was the case in, in, in the African minerals situation. Uh, and I think those, those standards, if they are put in place, may um, lead to some further interesting cases in this area, because I think they may help to um, provide evidence which could be quite useful in claims in the future. But I think we, we really are a long way, um, and I do think that this case is the beginning of, of seeking to uh, establish liability in this area. Thank you very much, Sophie. It's certainly reassuring to see so many landmark decisions and that the jurisprudence is developing further, but it's also good to remember still about the gaps and um, where we still as a community need to work further and unite our efforts. Thank you very much for this. Um, I'm now moving to um, Anil Ilmas Vastadis, who is a senior lecturer. Um, I actually don't see Anil on my screen. Anil, are you here? Uh, da, 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 da. I think we might have lost Daniel for for a while. We'll contact her separately. Um, Daniela, can you please send an email for me? Thank you. And I apologize for the slight um, delay. Technology is not always um, working for us. Um, Anil was going to talk about supply chain liability and the relevance of current company jurisprudence for supply chain, um, for supply chain context. And I hope she will join us um, soon. But meanwhile, we have a few questions and I will start um, addressing them to our speakers. Uh, Richard, um, we have a question about uh, the relevance of the UNGPs. So as we already uh, mentioned with China that uh, UNGPs were referred to for uh, probably one of the first times in climate change litigation. And how is your view on the likelihood of a similar approach being taken in the UK and elsewhere? And please feel free also to comment um, on the speakers, on the other presentations from the speakers. Thank you. Okay, I mean, I'll make a general comment about the the relevance of the potential relevance of the UNGPs to uh, liability of of pairing companies, which is that, um, especially uh, in light of the decision in Vedanta, then a company which subscribes to the UNGPs, which include, of course, in pillar two, the corporate uh, duty to respect human rights due diligence principles, then I think that, um, that a potential uh, liability uh, may arise. I, before the, the, um, the question of the UNGPs arose, there were cases which had referred to the, the voluntary principles on security and human rights. And we had one case a few years ago against a company called Extrata where we refer to this, um, these principles, which a company, a mining company had committed itself to. And the judge specifically uh, um, concluded that where a company um, holds itself out as subscribing to such principles, then you, you expect that that will be more than lip service, that it must, it must mean something more than just um, uh, hot air. And by the same token, a company which subscribes to the UNGPs, and in particular, the principles of human rights due diligence, uh, must, uh, must be um, taken to be serious about that. And so it should take steps to, should have taken steps to analyze the risks of human rights violations occurring at the various 
stages of its business operations and taken reasonable steps to, to minimize adverse impacts. And where it fails to do that, well, first of all, that's that, that may translate into a legal duty, and where it has failed to uh, take those steps and harm has occurred as a result, then that would constitute a breach and give rise to liability for harm that has occurred. So I think that's the, the principle that, uh, that companies are concerned about because uh, these are meant to be voluntary principles, um, the UNGPs, but I think it's, it's clear there's an increasing recognition that it must, they must mean more than that. Um, if I can just say something, um, just in, uh, comment on uh, the point that Sophie uh, made, I think, which um, certainly resonates with us because we did that case, the, the Sierra Leone case, the Karma case, and we're very disappointed with the decision. And of course, you're right, this distinction between um, uh, the actions of a subsidiary or employees of a subsidiary and public security or third party criminals um, is, uh, is significant. And I mean, clearly where you've got employees of a company or the company's private security engaging in criminal acts or human rights violations uh, against individuals, then the situation is rather different. And we saw that, for instance, with the case uh, that I did many years ago against Monterico Metals for Peruvian environmental protesters. And much more recently, my colleagues have done cases um, for, against Gemfields and Petro Diamonds. And of course, the Kakuzi case, where you had allegations of the direct involvement of mine security. So that's rather different. But I do agree with you that there is a bit of a, that there is a sad um, gap uh, in the law on liability when it comes to uh, the involvement of public security on which um, uh, these companies rely to generate huge profits for themselves in gold mines and other industries. And if if they're able to hide behind the fact that it's public security and even though they've been paying them um, for their services and providing them with um, methods, a means to facilitate those services, if they can avoid liability by just saying that you know, these were the actions of a, a, the legitimate authority, law enforcement authorities of uh, a country, even though they uh, they knew full well from past dealings with them that they were likely to perpetrate human rights violations, then that's a serious, a serious gap. And given that they make, if they're profiting from the, from the activity, then I think um, Martin's point about some kind of strict liability for that would be, um, would be um, justified. And of course, I guess if they if a com one of those companies has subscribed to the UNGP, so an interesting different question then arises about the, the potential liability that that could give rise to. Um, maybe not under a common design principle, but under, common, uh, under, under negligence principles. Uh, the common design uh, uh, law, as you said, I mean, requires uh, intention uh, to, uh, to achieve the end result which I mean, is, is rare, rarely going to be the position uh, with, these, uh, with these companies, but um, it, is a, it is a serious gap. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much, Richard. Um, while Anil is trying to reconnect, I will um, address next uh, question to Chana. And we have a question about um, enforceability of final judgments. When it comes to environmental damage, it's likely that the final judgment needs to be enforced in the place where environmental harm occurred. In such a case, whether the final decision of the home state court like Dutch court could be enforced and whether the environment could be remedied effectively. And maybe we can put into, into a broader question of what is an effective remedy for victims in this question, in these cases, is monetary compensation always um, a solution or we need a wider range of remedies? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, and that touches upon 
yeah, some, some real complications that we are facing in the Nigeria case. Um, we, um, to begin with your final, final question, um, whether um, compensation, in, well, whether compensation is, is the best remedy or the only remedy that we're looking at, um, in any case, it's a very concrete one. It's easier, I guess, to execute uh, an obligation to, um, to give compensation than other types of, um, of uh, obligations. Um, including um, Shell's obligation now to install a leak detection system, or as we also claimed in Nigeria case, to, um, to, to actually perform a proper cleanup um, on the polluted sites, because how are you going to, to check um, and enforce it? Um, there is no treaty between the Netherlands and Nigeria to make sure that it is enforceable directly, so you depend on Nigerian courts. Um, and what we see in our Nigeria case is that actually the part of the compensation is creating complications for us since the Nigerian farmers have directly been um, forwarded as we, to, so as we say in, in Dutch legal procedure to, to a damage assessment procedure, but the individual local systems have to claim compensation on the basis of the declaration of law that was granted uh, to Friends of the Earth. But since only Shell Nigeria has been held liable in that case, and not the parent company has been held liable for compensation, that means that the local victims will need to go to a Nigerian court to actually claim their compensation. So until now, they're, they're empty handed and, you, and, and hopefully we'll find a way to make sure that the compensation is granted to them. So actually in this case, what you see is it's much easier, um, the other obligation to install a leak detection system simply because um, the court has awarded a penalty, um, both as regards uh, the Shell um, Nigeria and the parent company of 100,000 euros for each day that it fails to install such system after the period of a year. So this is one of the, the, the main advantages, of course, of having the parent company included um, in the case because enforcement of any obligation, whether it's about compensation or an injunction, as regards the parent company can be enforced within the Netherlands. And even when it's translated into a penalty or, or, or money, it is in the end an effective way to make sure that the corporation does what it is expected to do on the basis of its judgment. I'm not sure if that answers the question entirely, but um, perhaps it gives a bit of illustration. Thank you very much. Um, Martin, there, is, there are a number of questions uh, for you. And uh, one of them is from um, Greg, who asks whether from the UK perspective, realization of parent company liability for corporate groups requires us to recognize that there has been a conceptual overreach of Salomon case. Um, and moreover, does enterprise liability require the relocation of tort liability into company law provisions? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, excellent question or questions. Um, so, so yes, I would say uh, yes to both. Um, when the legislator created limited liability, they didn't think of, of groups. Um, and, and Solomon wasn't a case about groups, but it was just then later taken by courts um, as a precedent and, and just applied to the group context. So as an example, Lord Justice Slade and the Adams uh, and Cape case said, uh, limited liability, you know, is part of our law and it applies to groups as well. If you don't like it, you know, too bad, but that's, you know, how things work. So I think there, there would need to be a recognition that that wasn't the right thing to do. Um, and in terms of what would need to happen to implement that, um, I think it would it would need a change in, in corporate law. That's the most straightforward way uh, because it is a modification of limited liability. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, Anil has joined us again. Anil, please let us know if um, you can uh, speak now. Yes, excellent. I'm, I'm really sorry, my internet and then my computer crashed. Just no worries. Time. <laughs> it's not a problem at all. Um, Anil is a senior lecturer at Essex School of Law. Her main research interests are in the fields of international investment law and business and human rights. Anil leads several projects within the Essex Business and Human Rights Project, including 
one of the recent ones on improving corporate human rights accountability in global supply chains. And this is the scope of your intervention today. What are the implications of cases involving the current subsidiary relationship for the supply chain liability? Thank you. Thank you, Katya, and thank you for organizing this event to you and to Carlos. And I'm sorry for disappearing. I just, the technology isn't on my side today. <clears throat> so I just want to say a few words first about some key features of supply chain relationships that actually distinguish them from the parent subsidiary context. Since the recent case law from the UK explicitly focuses on corporate groups, I think it's important to understand some of the differences and note these. Um, I will then talk a little bit about how, despite the differences in the way the relationships are structured in these two areas, um, the Vedanta and the, Okpa, and the Vedanta and Okpabi jurisprudence actually opens the way for potentially, this is the key word here, I think, holding businesses liable in tort for harm suffered by workers and communities within their supply chain. Then finally, I'll say a few words about potential limitations, and I'm hoping that my internet won't crash again. Um, so starting with structure, um, supply chains do have very complex structures often, um, not always, but often, and they give rise to different constellations of relationships. As such, they can be quite challenging to map out um, by especially external actors like those who have been harmed by, uh, by business activity. Um, supply chain relationships can also, they're quite dynamic, so they can also change at a fast pace. Um, for example, when purchasing companies shift suppliers seasonally, they might shift the country from which they procure rapidly depending on changing conditions. Corporate groups themselves can also be quite complex, but I think they're less diverse um, than supply chain structures and they're not as dynamic as supply chains. Um, they're, they're a bit more stable. <clears throat> Another feature to note is that both corporate groups and supply chains are made up of separate legal entities. This has been already discussed and um, each business within the structure is an independent entity, obviously, within both contexts. Um, companies within corporate groups are bound to each other by direct or indirect shareholding, as Martin explained. Um, whereas in the supply chain context, um, the actors are at best bound by a contractual relationship. But this is like, this reaches up to usually the first year of the supply chain. Beyond the first year of a business the supply chain, it's unlikely that there will even be a formal legal relationship between the lead company, the lead brand, uh, and the lower tier suppliers. So how can we expect then a business to be liable for harms occurring in the first or further tiers of its supply chain? Can we apply the principles um, developed in Vedanta and Okpabi in the supply chain context, despite these differences. Now, despite the types of relationships we see in, in supply chains, businesses are increasingly requiring their direct or indirect partners um, to abide by standards or codes of conduct on health, safety, labor rights, human rights, and protection of environment. And these, are, these codes or standards are often complemented either by audits or certification to ensure that the standards are complied with. I'd like to note here, though, that despite the wide usage of these tools to audits and certification, there is now a body of research showing how ineffective these mechanisms actually are. Thus far, it hasn't been possible to hold a lead company, a brand liable under tort law for harm suffered by workers or communities in the supply chain, at least not to my knowledge. Um, Well-known cases that have been unsuccessful in this area include Jabir and others and Kik in Germany, or Das and West, George Weston Limited in Canada. Again, all of these cases were um, they, they were barred at the jurisdictional um, phase for arguments that we have often seen in the context of um, corporate groups. Um, these cases, similar to parent company cases, relied on proving a novel type of duty under the tort of negligence up to now. So they used the criteria laid out in the Caparo case, the one that, that um, Richard mentioned at the start, so looking at 
proving the foreseeability of the harm in the supply chain context, proximity of the relationship between the lead company and the claimants, and the question of fairness and re reasonableness of imposing a duty. Um, and similar to the challenges that we've seen in the context of corporate groups when arguing for a novel duty of care, um, it's been difficult to show that there was a sufficiently proximate relationship between the workers suffering in the supply chain and the lead company. Obviously, another challenge that has been always there is whether this is fair or reasonable. And the question around proximity often boils down to whether the parent company exercises a certain level or type of control over the subsidiary. Um, and then fast forward to the UK Supreme Court's decision in Vedanta, um, it was very clear um, that the court established that the set of relationships within a co corporate group did not give rise to a novel duty. Um, there was no, it was held that there was no separate category of negligence for this type of triangular relationship between a parent, its subsidiary, and those harmed by the subsidiary's activity. The court basically looked at, and I'm quoting here, whether A owes a duty of care to C in respect of the harmful activities of B. So here is the triangular relationship that the court looked at. So its focus is not on ownership of shares or control per se exercised by a direct or an indirect owner of a subsidiary in these cases. Um, instead, the court very much focused on whether there was, there was some type of control or supervision either exclusively or jointly exercised by the parent over a certain function or an activity carried out by the subsidiary. Um, the court looked at whether the parent company has assumed a duty of care by taking certain steps vis-a-vis uh, -vis the activities of its subsidiary. Um, <clears throat> so I think that this general approach that the court, the UK Supreme Court took to negligence in the context of these triangular relationships that we see in corporate groups or in the context of supply chain and its interpretation of what may count as an assumption of duty opens up the possibility of successful negligence claims for harms suffered within the supply chain. In fleshing out whether the parent assumed responsibility, the court focused on whether the parent exercised supervision and control over the particular damaging activity undertaken by the subsidiary and not on whether the parent company generally exercised a high level of control over the subsidiary. And these principles were also endorsed in Okpabi. In Okpabi, the court held that the relevant inquiry was whether, uh, was the extent to which the parent did take over or share with the subsidiary the management of the relevant activity or, fun or function. So I think this is quite important in the context of certain supply chain relationships because there will often be a situation where the lead company will be sharing with the factory owner, for example, the owner of the supplier factory, the management of a certain activity like health and safety in the factory. Um, and the other indicators um, which have already been mentioned include providing defective advice, taking steps to implement policies, by the parent company or holding out that a company exercises a particular degree of supervision. We can see that in some supply chain contexts, brands or lead companies often do all of these things as well. Um, so, so these kind of, this focus on management or supervision of a function um, can potentially apply to the relationship between a lead company and its suppliers which are contractually required to follow the lead company standards in the areas of health and safety, human rights, labor rights, and environmental protection. Um, standards imposed by brands are often similar to those imposed by parent companies. Sometimes supply chain standards include provision of training to suppliers, purchaser monitoring performance via its own audits or requires third party audits, um, requirements for correction of shortcomings, that were identified during the audit practice um, provides um, company-based internal grievance mechanisms for affected persons. 
and sometimes including sanctions for failure to correct these problems, which can sometimes include termination of the business relationship. So in other words, as far as the areas subject to these code of conducts or standards are concerned, uh, it might be arguable that the lead company has taken over or is sharing the management or supervision of those functions um, with, the, with the supplier. Um, am I running out of time? <laughs> Uh, it, it will be helpful if you wrap up. Uh, okay, I'm going to wrap up. One, two minutes. Thank you. Um, and, and we know that many brands do disclose these policies on their websites and public disclosures. Now, just a quick thing on limitations. Obviously, this wouldn't be an easy case to make, I'm sure, as it's not easy to make the parent company cases as well. Um, I think one difficulty generally applying in this context is difficulty of formulating certain human rights abuses as tort claims. I think some human rights harms lend themselves more readily to be formulated as tort claims um, if they're involving physical injury or loss of life, but certain abuses that are actually really pervasive in supply chains, such as excessive working hours, low wages, discrimination, debt bondage, may not as easily lend themselves to a tort claim. Um, there is obviously questions over up to which tiers of the supply chain this type of duty can extend, especially considering most severe abuses are present in the lower tiers of the supply chain. It can be difficult to make a case that a, a lead company should be responsible for abuses in the fifth tier of its supply chain. And the question of degree of control over a particular activity will be important. And just to conclude, I think another interesting argument could be one that was made in the Begum and Maran case that was already mentioned, the creation of a dangerous condition. We know that many brands set really exploitative conditions of work by imposing short deadlines for manufacturing, setting excessively low prices and changing orders at short notice, non-payment of orders, which can itself create really dangerous conditions. And that can be potentially a basis of uh, a negligence claim. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anil. We have received during your presentation at least two um, requests to share the details of the cases that you're mentioning. So if you have a chance to type it in the Q&A box, that will be super helpful. Well, thank you very much for your very insightful presentations. And I have one question uh, for each of the speakers. And I ask you, because we don't have too much time, I ask you to um, keep it to two, three minutes and we'll go in the order of um, your presentations as well. So the first um, question for Richard. Um, Richard, you will comment a little bit on um, framing um, human rights abuses as negligence cases and using tort law to um, respond to human rights uh, violations. But also a question I have for you is um, about confidential settlement agreements. So for example, in January earlier this year, Vedanta agreed to settlement without admission of um, liability and the settlement agreement was confidential. Uh, more recently, Petra Diamonds uh, also settled claims in relation to the abuse is linked to the security operations um, at the mine in Tanzania. There was again no admission of liability, but the settlement was not confidential, if I understand, and it was um, very progressive and setting up grievance mechanism, etc. Um, sometimes confidential settlement agreements are viewed with a note of disappointment by the community, because obviously we do not move to the case on the merits. Can you please reflect from your point of view on um, this aspect? Thank you. Okay, on, on, the, um, on the first point about characterizing human rights abuses as negligence claims, I, I mean, I take on board the point that uh, Anil made. Uh, in fact, um, a slightly different point is often made against tort claims, which is that they, the, the language of negligence diminishes the significance of, uh, of especially when he, serious human rights viol violations have occurred. And that was also a point that was an observation that was made by this by the Canadian Supreme Court in the Nefson case, and it obviously has a lot of force. The one thing I would say about that is that, um, despite the language of negligence, the facts do emerge in those cases, and I think the the gravity of what has happened 
will emerge whatever you call it even if you if you uh, describe it in the language of negligence um, people can see what has actually happened um, so that on that point on the question of confidential settlements yes i mean you're right a lot of um public interest lawyers and and um uh, NGOs are concerned about confidential settlements and uh, of course um, it uh, at one level I, I agree with that and and um, it would you know often we are are required to enter into confidential settlements on behalf of clients which we would prefer were made public that's not always the case I mean there are some cases where uh, it's in the it's important for a settlement to be confidential for instance if people who are vulnerable are receiving money uh, if that is known by um, in in the local community they they may be put at risk and in one case we've had recently the government that a, a government was demanding to know how much individuals had received and we refused to tell them so confidentiality confidentiality was absolutely crucial so i think what i'm what i'm getting at is that i think as, as lawyers doing cases our primary obligation is to act in the best interests of the people we are representing and first we want to protect their security but secondly often the people that we are representing not always but often they are desperately poor and obtaining monetary compensation is a priority for them and if a company says that um, they are only prepared to pay people compensation or they're prepared to pay people a certain amount of compensation if the settlement is confidential then uh, it's often in the client's best interest to agree to that bearing in mind that um, if they don't accept it the litigation may go on for a long time so that payment of money that's desperately needed is delayed and of course there are always risks in litigation they 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 may end up not being compensated at all so i think those are the last point i'd make on this is that uh, the fact that a case is settled on a confidential basis doesn't mean that it doesn't have value from a public interest perspective for instance it may be that during the course of the litigation as, ha as, as happened with the Vedanta case, there's been a really important judgment which has benefited not only the victims of the Vedanta, uh, the Vedanta claimants, but other human rights uh, claimants uh, in future cases, like the Okpabi claimants or other, other claimants, as, the, uh, as it's benefited, that case has benefited the claimants in the, in the Dutch case, in the Netherlands. So uh, you can't underestimate the importance of decisions that are made in cases uh, during the litigation, even though those cases may ultimately be settled on a confidential basis. Thank you very much, Richard. I very much agree with you that um, the, the decisions such as Vedanta have certainly a regulatory perspective and dimension and not just uh, should be viewed as a dispute between um, two parties. Thank you very much. Um, Chana, uh, I'll ask you to pick up on what Richard was saying and reflect a little bit uh, more on choice uh, for either customary international law, Nigerian human rights law and or taught um, in the litigation and just what is um, behind the scene, um, the strategy and the tactics that is going um, on um, in your firm, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, as Richard is, is also saying, basically, you, as a lawyer, you always look at a case and see what's in the best interest of your client. And that includes, to some extent, um, the legal framework that you're using. Um, for as far as you have a choice, that is. But um, um, first, let me, let me explain that within the Dutch legal framework, there's not really a big difference in a case based on human rights law or a case based on tort. Obviously, the source that you're referring to is different, but they'll both be included in the article that I pointed out in my presentation, an unlawful act that can be an act, you know, contrary to what is socially accepted, it can be an act contrary, in violation of someone's rights, or it can be an act in violation of a, a legal duty. Um, and that includes fundamental rights, and it includes basically uh, torts. So, um, so the, the framework is pretty much the same as, as we've seen in our 
cases on Nigeria, that's very different in a, in a common law system. And um, we have another case pending of Ms. Kiobel and uh, three other Nigerian widows against Shell that is based on Nigerian um, human rights law. Um, and it was really the circumstances of the case that um, led us to Nigerian human rights law rather than tort. And it has additional advantages, for example, uh, like uh, limitation periods that are different um, and that are uh, very often quite limited in, um, in torts. Uh, we've looked into the, the option of customary international law, but that brought us nowhere in that case. Would have we might have opted for something like that had it been available and you know had it had it looked like a proper way to to bring the case but, and but you're already dealing with cases that are out of the ordinary they're in not in their usual legal system so you always have to 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 see what is also most convincing in terms of the facts of the case and the legal basis that you're using because you you need to to make it very clear to the courts that you have a proper case there, even when there are so many you know, complications on the way. So particularly when applying a foreign system of law, I would be hesitant as a lawyer to try to stretch it too far. And you, you look for what gives you the, the, the best arguable case and the most um, convincing framework looking at the facts that you have at stake. Thank you very much, uh, Chana. Uh, Martin, the next question is uh, for you. Um, the question is from Usman Malik, who asks, how do you see the tension between using the doctrine of vicarious liability to impose supply chain liability on parent companies with the principle of limited liability and what are the counter arguments that you can expect and how the project uh, purpose of the corporation um, helps um, in advancing group liability? And if you can fit it for two, three minutes, please. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. So I would say on its face, there is no conflict between vicarious liability and limited liability. You know, business has always been subject to vicarious liability. Um, so that, that's not an issue. It only becomes an issue when vicarious liability is stretched in order to achieve certain policy outcomes that we would like to implement. And if that's the case, and, and that can happen, I think it's better to just be honest and, and, and change the law in the first place. In terms of counter arguments, well, one would be uh, saying that there's vicarious liability for suppliers, it's too broad, it's, it's too much liability exposure for businesses. And of course, so far, courts in the UK and elsewhere have not accepted vicarious liability in the parent company or the, the supply chain context. But, you know, as a matter of law, there's no reason why it shouldn't be possible to impose vicarious liability when it comes to supply chains. Um, another kind of argument would be that it gets a bit difficult um, when we let plaintiffs go after a group because there uh, might be certain minority shareholders involved that are not part of the, of the core group and then it gets a bit messy so the, the details would be probably quite difficult to work out not impossible but definitely needs a lot of, of thinking um, and oh, purpose of the corporation. Um, so for those who don't know that, that's, that's a project um, run out of Oxford, um, directed by Professor Colin Mayer, uh, which essentially is about advancing the idea of a stakeholder's view of the corporation. And I think that, you know, it's very useful. It helps to develop the, the general theoretical underpinning of broader corporate and parent liability. Uh, but of course, it has no direct impact on the law itself, but sort of as, as background, um, very helpful. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, Sophie, if you could please address the question um, of the effect of the policies of respect for human rights, which are adopted uh, voluntarily by the corporations. What is, what is their effect to the third persons? Can they give rise to a claim against the company? That's a, a, tri a tricky one. So <laughs> I, I looked at the question in three parts. Um, so voluntary human rights policies um, and you know, can 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 employees rely on, the, on them um, in respect of the condition, conditions that they um, can expect and could they rely on them in a claim? 
Um, in, in relation to, to those, th those two aspects of the question, I think it very much depends on how specific the human rights, the voluntary policy is and how it ties into their contract of employment. So again, those questions are going to be quite fact specific. Um, in relation to third parties being, in, being able to rely on policies, well, it, again, it depends on what those policies are and it depends how they're expressed. For example, in Okpabi, um, obviously, the, um, we, we, we looked um, at the standards that Shell had claimed it ad adopted and policies that it claimed it had adopted. And we did seek to um, suggest that that was an important element of the duty of care, that it was holding itself up to, um, to, to promote such standards. And it was saying that it did, and therefore that was part, it was adopting a duty there. The court in Okpabi didn't really want to engage in that too much. So it, it's slightly um, tricky to say whether third parties can rely on statements made by companies in that way. I think it very much depends how specific they are, whether any when the, whether there has been, been any follow-up conduct in relation to those standards and, and policies. Um, so I think it, it, it's difficult, but possible. Thank you very much. We just have to see how the jurisprudence will develop further and whether a copy will move to the merit stage or not. Um, thank you, Sophie. Yugosa, I have a next uh, question for you. You mentioned that there is a lack of political uh, will on behalf of Nigeria and that there is no government, governmental action uh, following um, the cases in the UK and uh, in the Netherlands. So in your opinion, what do we need to make Nigeria or any other host state to act? And do you think that UN treaty or any similar initiatives have a value and will be more powerful? Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, it depends. I think, um, firstly, uh, the NGOs have a massive role to play in terms of publicity, and they do that a lot. So, uh, ERAS, uh, SERAP, they always use this judgment as a way to basically uh, have positive uh, public opinion and stuff. So it's a bargaining chip for the NGOs, especially. I think uh, a very one stakeholder that is actually neglected in this conversation is the judiciary. I think the judiciary has a massive role to play because in terms of the relevance of the Barbie case, for example, because Nigeria has a common law heritage that we have more value to the Nigerian jurisprudence, for example, in terms of being of um, authoritative um, value to the Nigerian court, for example. So the next question is, what is the relevance of the Dutch cases to the Nigerian courts? So how would the Nigerian courts look at the Dutch cases? Does it have any persuasive value? That's a big question. So in terms of interpreting, in terms of the foreign judgment, the judgment has already been, it's already been implemented by paying the compensation, really. So by paying the compensation, you are implementing the judgment. So what extra role does the judiciary have to play? I think that is when the creativity of the judiciary has the role to play. Uh, the Dutch decision might not be of any persuasive value to the Nigerian court, but activist judges, activist lawyers can use that as a way to basically move uh, steady judges towards some set decisions. Why am I saying that? In, in the case I mentioned earlier, the oil pollution case, in that case, one of the judges in that case that gave the judgment is, is a retired professor. He has written a lot of articles on enforceability of socioeconomic rights in his previous life as an academic justice Wednesday. So in that case, even though right to environment was not part of the remit of that case, just the justiciability of right to environment was not was not part of the claims in that or a pollution case. The Nigerian Supreme Court said Obita that on the basis of African Charter of Human People's Rights, even though Nigerian Constitution does not make right to the environment enforceable, they think right to the environment can be made enforceable by the African Charter. But the statement was made Obita it was not part of the judgment. So what does that mean? That means if you have activist lawyers, activist judges and you have a bench who is willing to be creative, then there's a massive potential as well. So I think a judiciary, the Nigerian judiciary, has a massive role to play. And I think in all the conversation we've had so far, there appears to be a neglect of the role of the Nigerian judiciary. So what role can the Nigerian judiciary do to help in embedding 
those judgments within Nigerian jurisprudence. So another example I was going to give as well, for example, the Serac case or the African Commission case. Even that case I was given a couple of years ago, very few African courts have actually referred to the Serac case in their jurisprudence. Well, things are changing now. Even domestic courts in Africa are now referring to the Serac case in their jurisprudence. So in terms of these decisions by the Dutch courts and the English courts, it's not just for Nigeria only. There's a potential that other African courts, other national courts, like a very future-looking court, like South African courts, South African Constitutional Court, for example, could also take it further and try to make reference to it. So I think there's a massive potential for the utility of the judgment. So I think let's not just restrict the utility of the value only to the Nigerian space. There's a, I think there's a massive potential on the African continent, even some regional courts, for example, because somebody made, exa made reference they made reference to the United Nations guiding principles. But in the Serap case in 2012, in the ECOWAS court, was one of the first courts that actually made reference to the United Nations guiding principles. So in a way, the African sub-regional courts are actually doing a massive role. So I think there should be a collaboration, a synergy between the what is happening in Europe, sub-regional courts in Africa, regional courts in Africa, and national courts of domestic uh, judiciaries in African states. So if you're able to have that synergy, it could be training for judiciary staff in Africa, it could be training for Nigerian judges, for them to understand the implication, the utility of the judge, but otherwise it's just going to end up as a relic to them. So this is a, I just thought of that, I said I'm just going to give that point. Thank you very much. I hope Thank that you very much. answered your question. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for outlining once again the broader context, which is uh, great and just talking not about Nigeria, but going beyond and talking about generally the um, African continent. Thank you very much for that. Katia, you're muted. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> the one last question, Anil, is for you, and that will be about the alternative grounds for suing lead companies for violations in the global um, supply chains and whether unjust enrichment, for example, or consumer protection um, laws can provide um, a valid means. Thank you. Thanks. There is actually a question in the chat from Rachel Chambers on unjust enrichment in the case that Lee Day brought um, against British American Tobacco and Imperial um, for tobacco farming in, in Malawi, which did rely on unjust enrichment. So maybe I'll leave that to Richard to comment on because I'm not an expert on un unjust enrichment. I know what it is, but I don't exactly know how you can rely on it in the context of this. Um, at least not, I don't know how you can rely on it successfully in the context of supply chains. but. Um, when it comes to other mechanisms um, to hold corporations accountable in the context of supply chain abuses, one, one strategy that has been used is consumer litigation um, for misleading advertising or misleading disclosures. Um, consumers, I think there, was, there were a couple of cases in Europe, some in the US. Um, I think the, the US cases haven't been successful really on kind of uh, achieving any kind of successful outcome um, when it comes to these kind of misrepresentations because um, they were, the claimants were unable to show the specific um, harm they, they suffered as consumers when, when a brand doesn't disclose or discloses misleading information on, for example, packaging of, of a product in terms of, for example, if it's chocolate, where the cocoa is coming from and under which conditions that cocoa has been produced. Um, whereas in Europe, um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a complaint brought against Lidl, I think, if I'm not mistaken, which was successful, but the outcome was that they would simply remove certain statements from their advertising materials to consumers. So, while that was a successful outcome, technically, I don't know if that really achieves the purpose here because it doesn't really achieve any change probably in the behavior of the company. It just merely, you know, forces the company to remove that kind of information on, on how ethical their products are. Um, plus, 
consumer strategies are again i think they can be part of probably an overall framework of accountability but they don't really provide any remedies to those who have been harmed um, so again they they have certain limitations another strategy that has been advocated is to use contractual clauses in the supply chain for the benefit of third parties and then have third parties enforce these but again Jurisdictions have really different rules on on contr on contracts generally, but also on how contracts for the benefit of third parties or contractual clauses for the benefit of third parties can be regulated. So while there can be some promising um, progress under contract law, I think in this area where workers, for example, in a supplier factory can potentially rely on a contractual clause between the buyer and the supplier. Again, it depends on a lot of different factors, whether that will be successful and whether the workers will even be aware of that kind of clause and whether that will reach beyond the first year of the supply chain to you know, subcontracted workers, informal workers within the supply chain. Thank you very much, uh, Anil, and it's excellent timing. We are um, approaching the end of our first panel, which was excellent very insightful and there is a lot to reflect on um unless any other speak unless any speakers want to make a final comment i will just wrap up uh thanking all of you for this very knowledgeable and insightful discussion i would also like to thank our audience for very interesting questions and of course to colleagues um at the international commission of juries and at the bonavari institute of human rights for putting this event together please don't uh forget that next monday we're meeting again at 2 p.m. UK time uh, for our second panel, which is uh, called Access to Justice, Challenges and Opportunities. Carlos will moderate the discussion and we will have, again, very knowledgeable speakers who will share their views on perspectives. In the chat, you can find a link. You will need to register separately. The link that you use today will not work. And then just as a reminder that um, on 21st of June, Apinia Juris will start publishing also a series of blogs or reflecting also on all of the things that we have covered today but thank you very much everyone for joining us today it was an excellent event and we will see you next monday thank you